Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us for this Rotronic Instrument Corporation Humidity Webinar, How to Choose a Best Fit Humidity Instrument. And this series of webinars is all about helping you to make a better measurement of humidity. If you've been attending our past webinars, this one is sort of a capstone for the last two. The last one, we did a humidity theory webinar and we did a humidity technology webinar. And now, not that you have to have attended those to get any to get benefit from this, but you might want to go back and check our on-demand webinars too, because we'll build on things like the humidity theory and the technology. Everyone who registered for this webinar will receive a copy of the slides and a link to the recording. We'll send this out via email within about 24 hours of this live broadcast. And we'll also post it on the Rotronic.com website. Just go to Rotronic.com and look for the Academy section. Everyone signed on out there today is in listen-only mode. That means you cannot speak to us directly via your phone or your computer, but we do want you to interact. We want to hear your questions. We want to hear your comments, and we'll have some polls throughout this webinar to help, in, to help you interact with us. But if you have a question or a comment, just find that questions panel in your control panel and open that up if it's not open. Type in a comment, type in a question at any time. We'll have two Q&A sessions for this webinar, one in the middle and one at the end. But type your question in at any time and then we'll be sure to take those up during the live Q&A session. Once again, this webinar is being recorded and it will be made available to everybody after this live broadcast. This webinar is presented and created by Rotronic Instrument Corporation. If you don't already know Rotronic, we manufacture precision measurement instruments for humidity, of course, dew point, carbon dioxide, temperature, water activity, and differential pressure. And we also offer a comprehensive continuous monitoring system for controlled environments and regulated environments. We don't talk about these products during this webinar, even on this one, how to choose. We're just sharing educational information, again, to help you make a better measurement. But if you do have questions about the webinar or about the products, feel free to reach out. Of course, we'd be delighted to discuss your application and help you fit an instrument to, your, to that application. Speaking today, my name is Bruce McDuffie. I'm with the Rotronic Marketing Department. And I've been in the humidity measurement business for about the past I think 10 or 11 years now. And I was a field sales person for years and I taught live seminars about humidity for years. I've seen a lot of applications. I've fitted a lot of instruments to different applications. Michael Botskis is your co-presenter today. And Michael is the lead metrologist with Rotronic Americas, specializing in relative humidity and temperature measurement. And Michael's been involved in manufacturing and calibration of humidity and temperature for about the past 19 years. Welcome, Michael. Thanks, Bruce. It's great to be here today. And before we get started, it's we'd like to get to know the audience a little bit. So I've got a couple of starter polls to help uh, with engagement and we'll share the results too so you can see what other folks, not by name, but by category are out there today. So the first question I have for you is, what is your industry? And just go ahead and click uh, choose your industry. Are you pharma biotech, HVAC, food production, oil and gas, or other? Usually on these we get other is the biggest category because we don't have enough room to put more categories. So if it is other, if you don't mind, just go ahead and type it in the questions pane. Type in what your industry is. Give it a few more seconds here. It sure seems like other is winning the day again. It sure does. There's some folks typing in. We've got distributor from Jason. We've got auto from Daniel. I assume that's automobile. And uh, good. Well, thanks everyone for sharing that information. I will close the poll. And you can see the results. Nobody from food or oil and gas, or nobody wants to admit it. <laughs> Not today. And one other question before we get into the <clears throat> excuse me, presentation. What is your role? 
What is your role? Are you the boss? Are you a facility manager, lab manager, a technician, or something else? We've got one, one person from the cannabis industry. Good. I'm in Colorado, so we know all about the cannabis, and Michael's in Canada, so we're all in the right place. Okay, give it a few more seconds. And we got other here on this one too. So yeah, type in your role too. We've got Brad says sales engineer. We like salespeople. Yep. Product manager and another sales rep. Yep. Right to see. Okay. And I'm sharing the results now so you can see. No facility managers or lab managers today. Okay, I'll hide the results. And with that, I will turn it over to Michael to go through our agenda today. So our webinar today, it's a little bit different format from what we've done in the past. There's no, we're not, not imparting technical information today. The, the goal of today's webinar is to get people thinking about their applications and the questions that they need to ask about what they need in an instrument. And by asking these questions, it's going to help us or help everyone here determine the best instrument for their particular application. So there's nine areas we're going to look at today, uh, starting with the measurement objective. Why do we want to take this measurement? We'll go in, look at the measurement environment, the performance that we need to get out of our instruments. We'll be looking at the parameters we want to measure, be it relative humidity or something else. How do we want the information to be presented? How are we going to report the data that comes out? How does the instrument get utilized? And are there logistical restrictions in our, in our particular application that are gonna make it difficult or or that we need to take into account when when selecting our instrument. We'll then go into some pricing considerations and manufacturer considerations. The key takeaways for today is really to understand what questions should be asked when choosing the hygrometer that you want for your for your application. And really these questions can can be applied to other uh, other applications as well, not just humidity measurement, but the same would go for almost any measurement that, that's being taken, uh, be it temperature, pressure, or any of the other ones. So the first thing we want to look at today is what is our measurement objective? Why do we want to make this measurement? There's a number of reasons that we might want to be making these. One of the first ones that comes to mind is a we're dealing with some sort of regulation or, or set of rules that says we need to make these or we need to make these measurements. This could be a federal regulation, uh, one of the 21 CFRs. Uh, it could be a local regulation or it could be something else. It could be something like an ISO standard or an ANSI standard that says this process, we need to monitor the, the humidity in it. We could be looking at maintaining product quality. Uh, we've got a picture here of one of my favorite little treats, gummy bears. Uh, humidity actually plays a very large role in the manufacturing and storage process of, of these candies. Too much humidity and, and the product gets sticky and it, it's not as enjoyable. Uh, we could be looking at customer specifications. Uh, if we're doing a specific application for a customer and they've said, we need to be operating within a certain set of control limits. Uh, if we've got an HVAC application, we could be dealing with human or animal comfort. We're looking at air quality and that, then we're looking at the amount of humidity in, in a space to make it comfortable for, for us to, to be operating. Uh, also in terms of HVAC, we could be looking at energy efficiency. How can we be operating these systems as efficiently as possible to lower our overall energy costs. Also process stability can come into play or to prevent condensation. There could be other measurement objectives. These are just a, a limited set, but there's always gonna be some reason why we're 
why we want to make this measurement. And quite often, we can also associate a cost with it. We can say we're doing this because if we don't, well, either we can't operate or we run the risk of, of having a large recall down the road. But we're doing this because for a good reason, because there's a cost associated with not doing it. So it's important to first understand what our measurement objective is. And then from that, it's going to help us understand and answer all the other questions here. And with that, I'll pass it over to Bruce to, to think about the measurement environment a little bit. It's important to understand the conditions under which you're going to measure. For example, what's the expected relative humidity range? It's, you'll have quite a different instrument if you're measuring in office environments where there's just ambient conditions where people live versus in a high temperature, high relative humidity chamber or a dry box. And so you have to understand the full range of relative hum humidity you're willing to, you're expecting. Same thing with water activity or the actual mass of the water vapor. What is your expected range? That will help determine the instrument. If you're measuring dew point, what type of dew point level are you expecting? It's much easier to measure a dew point with the calculated variables when you're at ambient or anywhere above 10% RH than it is to measure dew point accurately below, say, 5% RH. Also, temperature is very important. Instruments to with, who, that are made to withstand a higher temperature or a low temperature are going to be much more difficult to manufacture and probably more expensive than one that's not. If you have to have measurements in Antarctica, for example, then you'll need an instrument that can survive in minus 40, minus 50, minus 60 degree Fahrenheit temperatures and not only survive and report accurately, which is a much more difficult measurement. Will the air be moving in your environment? Are you measuring relative humidity or humidity parameter in a high flow tube or a high flow duct? Or will the air be stable? And this will go towards how quick do you know, need to know a change. If you have moving air, then it's going, and it does change, it's gonna be, the instrument will have to be faster detecting that. And finally, contaminants. Are there contaminants in your environment? Will there be certain chemicals in the air? Will there be particulates? Will there be dust and dirt that can clog up the filter, for example? And some sensors can deal with contaminants better than others. So know what contaminants should be expected and what concentration is expected in your environment so you can have an instrument that can handle that or you can have put in a sample process to handle that. Number three, what about performance, Michael? Now this is typically the topic that everyone goes straight to. Uh, it's one of the obvious ones. What is the performance of the instrument? And quite often we're looking right away at the accuracy or the uncertainty of the instrument. And this really gets driven by our measurement objective. Uh, the measurement objective should really be helping us understand how accurate of an instrument do we need. And that's really gonna help us narrow down uh, the, the potential instruments quite quickly. Um, the, the accuracy of them, well, you'll eliminate uh, a lot. If, if you need something with good accuracy, you're gonna eliminate a lot of the low cost ones very quickly, for example. Uh, but you, you'll then need to find a good balance. In addition to just our accuracy and our uncertainty of the instrument, the, the, res the response time of that instrument, as Bruce was just mentioning in our measurement environment, if it's changing very rapidly and we want to know about those changes, we need to make sure that we're choosing an instrument that can see and detect those changes as quickly as possible. And that might be a matter of selecting a different filter, a different screen that goes over the humidity sensor, protecting it from particulates. There's, there's various different screen membranes that can be used and the ones that are better at protecting the sensor end up slowing down the response time. It's one of the limitations with relative humidity sensors in that they have to be air breathers. And, and by that, 
we mean that they have to be exposed to the actual environment, including any contaminants, uh, in order to make their measurements. And because of that, we can't protect them as well as, as some of the other sensors we use, like temperature, and then they're more prone to potential drift, depending on what they're exposed to. So sometimes by protecting that sensor to a large degree for contaminants, we actually slow down the response time. So we need to know whether or not that's an issue for us. Long-term stability or the, the drift of the, of the measurement, um, all instruments can drift. The, the question is how much? Uh, we need to look at what type of drift is acceptable for us uh, and, and what an instrument is rated to do. Uh, that may change depending on the contaminants in that environment. Uh, so it's important for us to look at this and understand it because uh, it can affect the instrument that we use and potentially the calibration cycle that we use. Repeatability, hysteresis, and linearity. These come into the performance of the instrument. Quite often they're, they're lumped into the accuracy and uncertainty portions as well. Uh, another important parameter for the performance is the output resolution. If we need to be measuring something to one decimal place uh, and reporting it to one decimal place, but the instrument only shows, uh, it does, doesn't show any decimal places, obviously we need to rule them out that way. Uh, and it's not just the, the display, this resolution could be the analog outputs as well. Uh, there are cases where what can be displayed on a display of an instrument don't always match up to the resolution of the outputs. So those are some key things to look at for the performance of your instrument. And Bruce, I'll pass it back to you to look at parameters. It's important to think about and understand what parameter you have to report or discuss and what parameter the instrument is outputting and then it's also important to take another step and know where that, how it gets that measurement. In other words, does it calculate it or is it an actual direct measurement? And choosing the parameter builds on the previous three sections. And this whole entire series of nine questions you need to ask and get answered build on each other as you go through the process. As far as parameter, you want to ask how many parameters will you need to measure? Some instruments can measure multiple parameters, even in multiple different points. Others can only measure one or two. So no, if you get an instrument that can take three measurements, for example, or three sensors versus three separate instruments, that could, should be a consideration for you. Next, what are some common industry practices? If you're in a certain industry, maybe it's pharmaceutical or maybe it's, it's oil and gas and you have a process that you're controlling by measurement and you go to your annual convention and you, if you can't talk about the same parameter everyone else is talking about, it's going to be difficult to compare notes and share information. So maybe your industry will determine what parameter you have to measure and report. Your environmental conditions can also determine the parameter. For example, short story, when I was a field salesperson, I went out to visit a client who had a compressed air system and they were having trouble measuring the dew point. They said the dew point measurement was jumping all over the place. So I went out to visit them, went over, took a look at their dryers where their dew point sensors were, and sure enough, the instruments were outputting dew point, but it was all over the place. And they said, we've got a minus 40 degree compressed air system, and we see ranges from minus 60 to plus 10. Looked at their instruments some more, and it was determined that they did not purchase the correct instrument, which, by the way, is one of the most common problems with making a good measurement, is not choosing the right instrument to begin with. So these guys had an instrument that was had a relative humidity sensor and then it was and a temperature sensor, and then it was converting to dew point. Well, if that's your instrument, you can't get a, an accurate relative humidity measurement below 5% RH without special technology. So they had chosen the wrong instrument. The out instrument output dew point, but that's not enough. If, you, if it outputs its a parameter, make sure you know how you're getting it. So you make sure it's reliable and meets your application. 
how will the measurement be used? Well, if you have a control system or a measurement system that's expecting a certain input, you have to make sure you choose an instrument that can provide that parameter. And finally, regulation could determine what you're measuring. Maybe you have a regulation that says you have to report relative humidity in a storage warehouse. So, or maybe you have a, a regulation that says you've got to d measure an output and report parts per million. So you'll have to choose an instrument that can give you that measurement. Or maybe you have a customer, you're building a system for a customer and the customer has specific requirements. You'll have to match the instrument to those needs. And I believe we have a poll, an, a poll question for the audience now. We do. And this is right about what we just talked about, parameters. And the question is, what are your application measurement parameters? In other words, what parameters do you measure? And you can choose more than one if you happen to have more than one. So go ahead and choose the parameters you're measuring. It'd be great for anyone that selects other here. We'd love to know what parameter you're measuring and, and what that application is for. And after this poll, we'll go into a Q&A session. So if you've got a question on your mind, go ahead and type it in the chat, the questions panel, and we'll queue those up here with a, a live Q&A. The votes are coming in fast and furious, Michael. I, I'm, I'm surprised and impressed to see uh, there's quite a few people working in PPM. That's, uh, that's not something we see all the time. We don't see that too often. And we have 13% other. You guys who are choosing other, it would be really interesting to see what the parameter is and just a few words about the application. If you want to type that in the questions panel, you don't have to, but it would be interesting to see. Here's some, thanks for sharing that. Here's some temperature in active API warehouse storage. So temperature, okay? And then Gerald says, we control vapor deficit. Have you heard of that one, Michael? Uh, no, but it sounds like uh, dealing with with maintaining a, a humidity level would be my guess. I, I've not heard, I've not dealt with that one directly, no. Interesting. Okay, we can see the results. Relative humidity is by far the most common parameter, followed by dew point, wet bulb, and PPM. Pretty common, every time we ask the what parameter you're measuring, these are usually the results. <clears throat> okay, and with that, let's go into the Q&A session. <clears throat> Excuse me. Got a couple of questions coming in, Michael. Here's a good one. What is the difference between accuracy and uncertainty when choosing an instrument? That is a very good question, um, and un unfortunately, some of the answer can come down to the, the manufacturers and, and how they define them. Uh, when it comes to relative humidity sensors, accuracy is usually defined as the difference or the allowable error between what the instrument reads and what a reference would read. Uh, so just a simple look at the difference between them. The, the uncertainty of an instrument, that's taking a look at, at all the things that can that we're not 100% sure of when we're making a measurement that can affect our measurement. So it's looking at the, the calibration uncertainty of the references, it's looking at the impact of the, say, temperature when we're performing our calibration. It can look at the repeatability, the hysteresis, the linearity of the instrument. Uh, potentially the the accuracy or the error of the instrument is also in the uncertainty so quite often the the uncertainty of an instrument is going to be larger than the accuracy value but it's also the more it, it's more important for you to know the total uncertainty of your instrument because sometimes the the accuracy value when they're looking at the difference between the your unit and the reference it's not taking into account the uncertainty of the reference. So it doesn't give you the whole performance of, of what your instrument's going to do. And it also doesn't usually include your annual drift. So that 
those are some of the key differences between accuracy and uncertainty uh, for instruments. And we have we did a webinar exactly on that topic a while ago, and it's still available on demand on the Rotronic website. Again, just go to rotronic.com, go to the Academy section, and it was all about performance and uncertainty versus accuracy and so on. I think we have a document in there too about it. Okay, another question just came in, Michael from Aldo. What parameter would you recommend to measure for controlling a dryer, wet bulb or relative humidity? Um, I think it's going to depend a little bit on the temperature that the dryers are, are operating at. Uh, I would lean actually probably depending on how low you want to go dew point might be a parameter that you're interested in measuring uh, relative humidity could be used uh, it is temperature dependent though so you need to know very well the the temperature that you're measuring and if you're at a high temperature and a low relative humidity you could still have a lot of moisture there uh, if you went and measured it using dew point, you get rid of the temperature component uh, since dew point is not a, a temperature dependent value. Um, so I would probably lean towards relative humidity given those two options, uh, but I'd also suggest that maybe dew point might be a, a parameter to consider as well. Yeah, I agree. And one of the parameters or the questions would be how dry is your dryer going? If your dryer is going to an RH of less than even 10%, but definitely less than 5%, then you should be measuring dew point or PPM even. Okay, next question is from George. Oh no, we have one just came in from Vladimir. Let's see. Oh, this is about a Rotronic probe. We, we don't usually address direct Rotronic information. We'll get back to you, Vladimir, on that one after the webinar. Here's another one from George. What do I consider if I have a few different environments? What do you think, Michael? Well, I guess the question that I would have in that case is, are you trying to monitor all the environments with one instrument, in which case you're, you're, you're potentially trying to find the best compromise that will measure all the different environments, or can you use different instruments for the for the different environments um, in many cases you will be able to use the same instrument uh, for all those environments but that's not always the case so take a close look at what those environments are what the measurement goals are and that's going to tell you whether or not you want to have a few different types of instruments uh, for those environments and we have one last question for this middle q a session and here it is from Ray. Is there a certain technology I should choose for a dry chamber? This is similar to the question from Aldo. So on this one, I'm assuming that we're talking about a, a very low relative humidity chamber. Um, and it, it's likely actually being uh, defined as uh, the, the value being defined in, in dew point or frost point. Uh, so for those I'd be looking at, th there are capacitive based sensors that measure dew point. Uh, so those would be one of the considerations. Uh, the other consideration uh, would be a, a chilled mirror. Um, there are chilled mirrors potentially that are, are lower cost that might be applicable for this one, for this application, if one of the uh, capacitive sensor ones uh, doesn't have the accuracy requirement needed. So that's where I would start. And I'd refer, refer back to the webinar we just completed last month. It was on how the pros and cons of humidity measurement technology. A lot of great information there about choosing the right technology to match your application. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to the second half of the presentation. So number five out of the nine is what about the output or the signal required, Michael? So there's a lot of different outputs that we need to need to think about, but we, we can think we can think of this not just as electrical outputs, but 
how are we going to read and digest the information that the sensor is giving us? We're not putting the sensor there just for fun in most cases so that we can say we're measuring it. We actually want to get the information, digest it, read it, and do something with it. So the one of the most typical types of signal that we would want is some sort of visual display. Now that might be a display on the unit itself, or it might be a display on our computer if, if our instrument's connected to there. Uh, there are a lot, of, a lot of products out there that do not have a display on them. So if you want to be able to see the, the value that the instrument's reading by someone being able to walk up to it, a display might be an important feature for you. Uh, in many applications, it's not. Uh, most data logger products, there's actually no display on them at all. It's, it's just a, either a digital signal or analog signal out to another system. Talking about digital signals, uh, the common ones that we would have would be RS-232, Ethernet, Modbus, uh, potentially USB. Um, how, how are we trying to communicate with the with the measurement instrument. So now we need to look at if we're monitoring it with a software or if we're connecting it to another system, is there a digital signal that we can that we can utilize or that we need? The the other uh, signal that we might have is an analog signal. And here we're talking about a four to 20 milliamp output, zero to one volt, zero to 10 volt. Uh, Perhaps our process control systems, they're, they're looking for this analog signal out and that's how they take the data and then respond to it. In addition to just the signal output, potentially we want to be looking at some type of logging or recording available. And that might be, we require that some of that, that logging, that data logging be built into our, our instrument. Perhaps we want that to be integrated into the system and so that there's a, a, a battery backup in there so that if our whole other system goes down, we're still collecting data so that we can look at it in the future. Uh, we may also be connected into a building management system. Our, our sensors could be controlling the HVAC systems or it could just be a real-time monitoring system. So rather than actually controlling something, it's there just to watch over the, the environment in that location and report back. And then the, the real-time monitoring system is sending out alerts if we're getting over, rain, over allowable ranges. Another consideration would be, uh, could go back to some of our regulations. If we're in a pharma environment, perhaps we want to look at compliance to 21 CFR part 11. Uh, this relates especially to electronic signatures uh, where there needs to be some sort of sign off on the data collected. So there's a lot that we can think of in the different types of signal outputs. Uh, so it's important for us to know how do we want to take the data from our instrument and how are we going to use it? What, where do we want to feed that information to make the best use of it? pass it over then to Bruce uh, for question number six uh, for how our instrument will be utilized. Bruce, maybe if you can forward it on. Sure. Number six. There it is. How will the instrument be utilized? And this may seem straightforward, but it's not as straightforward as you may perceive it. Will it be a fixed transmitter? And if it is a fixed transmitter, if that's your plan, think about the environment where the transmitter with all of its electronics is going to be stored. Or if you're, for example, say you've got that measurement down in Antarctica and you buy a nice fixed transmitter with a nice LCD display on it, you put it outside the, the shed or whatever they have down there, and then it's minus 40 degrees, that LCD is not going to work. So your display is not working. So think about the environment. Granted, that's extreme, but it's important to understand how the instrument will be used. Will you need to take the instrument around to different places, for example, in your plant or different buildings, then a portable instrument would be required. Will you need to measure in situ inside your process, 
or inside your compressed air system, or will you be taking a sample off of the place where you want to measure? That will require different fittings, different instruments, different probes. Will it need to be accessible? Here's a story. I was When I was in the field, I visited a beer brewing company, and they had these 35-foot towers where they stored their product. And at the top of this tower was the instrument. So they called me up there. They said, we're having problems with this instrument. Can you help us out? I went up there and I said, where is it? They said, it's way up on top of the tank. I said, how do you get to it? What if you have to calibrate it? They said, well, we have to go down to the rental shop in town and rent a, a lift. And then we have to bring it out here on a truck. And then we have to put it and get up on top of the tank. They didn't think about accessibility. So now that instrument's probably never going to be calibrated. In fact, that was the problem. They hadn't calibrated it for eight years. So if you need it to be accessible, whether it's the probe itself or the transmitter itself or the point where you're going to calibrate it, that has to be something you consider. Will you have to remove it from a process, again, for maintenance or repair or calibration? If you're running a 24-hour a day, seven-day-a-week production facility that requires on this critical measurement to keep the process running, you're going to have to remove that at some time. So will you be willing to shut down for two hours or three hours or a day just to calibrate the instrument? Maybe you'll need a spare you can drop in, or maybe you'll need a special instrument where the probe can be calibrated in place. And then continuous monitoring. If your intent is to have a continuous monitoring system that monitors all kinds of different parameters from this instrument you're buying, then you have to think about the interface and you have to think about the data and the storage of the data and the backup of the data. And the instrument has to have a lot of different capabilities, of course, depending on the regulations, if it's pharmaceutical, CF 21 CFR part 11, and so on. So think about ahead of time, Picture in your mind, how will you be using this instrument? How will you need to access it? Will it have to be calibrated in place? And so on. How about logistical constraints, Michael? So there's a lot of different logistical constraints that we need to think about for our instruments. One of the more obvious ones is power. Most likely any instrument that we're, we're purchasing today uh, is going to require power of some sort. We're, we're probably not pulling out the horsehair hygrometers to put them out into our into our systems. So we need to look at how is our instrument powered? Do we have AC power available at our at the points that we want to measure, for example? Or are we going to be using a battery operated device? If it is battery operated, uh, is it accessible to change the batteries? Are those batteries that the product needs to go back to the factory to have replaced? Uh, is the battery replacement every six months, every year, every 10 years? Uh, are these batteries that we can easily purchase just going down to the corner store? Or are these specialty batteries that we have to go to a, a certain manufacturer to get? Uh, so power is actually a, is a very big concern for for our instruments, especially if we've got them uh, widely distributed through through our site. It looks like Bruce is uh, taking us back through <laughs> Sorry, Michael. presentation. There we go. <laughs> Apologies, everyone. Hit the wrong button. <laughs> uh, and OK, so after power, uh, another consideration would be whether or not we need to protect the, the instruments. And here, probably the electronics more than the sensors. If it needs to have a NEMA or IP rating on the enclosure to protect the electronics from from dust, uh, fine particulates, uh, or or uh, vapor spray that sort of thing, uh, do those exist in our environment? And do we need to to protect the the sensors or the electronics from them? And here here's where we might be choosing to have a a device that's going to have the sensor at the end of a long cable and and we can have the electronics somewhere else or completely sealed off from from the environment temperatures come up uh, a couple of different times 
Uh, the temperature can be very important to the sensing technologies, depending on what the temperature is, that can limit what type of technologies can be used. Uh, but more so than just the sensing technologies, we need to look at the at the electronics that are monitoring the, the sensor itself. Uh, if the temperature is too high, potentially those electronics are, aren't going to work. Uh, the same for, for very low temperatures. Um, those electronics might need to be isolated or potentially heated or something else in order to get the, the proper operation. Or it's going to affect our, it could affect our overall accuracy of the instrument. If we're dealing with a explosive environment where we've got fumes or vapors or even fine particulates that, that pose a, an explosion hazard, we might need to be looking for an instrument that has intrinsically safe certification or an EX or an ATEX uh, certification for it to ensure that that instrument is not going to create a spark that sets off an explosion. This is particularly important in the oil and gas industry, but it's also important in many other industries where it might not come to mind right away, but grain silos, for example, there can be a lot of fine particulates in there and those can create a need for an intrinsically safe device because if there is a spark, uh, it can create a huge fire. Depending on whether or not we've got a pressurized system or a vacuum, based system we ne might need to be able to put our our sensor through a some sort of fitting uh, it would be important for us to know that the sensor can can seal off in that fitting well both both on the on the outside edges but also that if we're under pressure or if we're in a vacuum that down the length of the probe that's been sealed off effectively as well so that we're not we're not losing pressure or, or allowing uh, air in through the length of the probe. But perhaps we need to deal with sample conditioning at that point, uh, which might mean we have to have other hardware present in order to take our measurements. The other one that doesn't come up uh, or isn't always thought of right away would be our, our signal and probe power uh, if we have to run those long distances. Uh, this can help us decide Okay, if we've got an analog output on our instrument, for example, and we know we need to run that signal for a long distance, we probably don't want to choose an instrument that only has a zero to 10 volt output. Over that long distance, the resistance of the wire is actually going to affect our readings. So it would be better for us to choose an instrument with a four to 20 milliamp output. Uh, so those are some of the logistical constraints. Uh, of course, we can't cover them all within this webinar. Uh, every application is different, so there's probably going to be some specific ones for for your particular application, but these are some, some key ones to start with. And with that, I'll pass it over to Bruce for everyone's probably least favorite uh, <laughs> topic, the appropriate price range. So what is an appropriate price range? Well, it was our friend Benjamin Franklin over there who said the bitterness of poor quality remains long after the sweetness of low price is forgotten. That's a very, very true statement. Depending on your environment, again, and your requirements and what we've been talking about up to this point, if you need better performance, it's going to be a higher price. If you need conformance to regulations, it'll be higher. If you're operating in harsh or extreme conditions, an instrument to operate in those conditions will cost more. And additionally, consider operating costs. For example, calibration. How often will the instrument need to be calibrated? Who will do the calibration? Is it something you can do yourself or will it have to go back to the factory? And how long will it be out of service? And will you have to, will you have to maintain spare parts? That's an additional cost. Will you have to have training and education by the manufacturer because the instrument is very sophisticated? For example, a high-end chilled mirror. Maybe you spend thirty dollars or $40,000 for a high-end chilled mirror. Chances are you're going to have to have somebody trained. So what is the cost of the training? 
is there a retraining required for that? And the cost of a poor or unreliable measurement can far outweigh the cost of even the most expensive hygrometer. Here's a true story. When I was a field salesperson, another field story, we got a letter in the mail from an attorney. And the attorney said, you've been named in a lawsuit. So he said, okay, we'll have to deal with it. So I was chosen to go out and inspect what happened. It was at a university. And one of the they had a very expensive art um, art museum, very high end, in some cases, priceless art. And they had a storage room where they kept this high priced art. And in the storage room, the temperature was maintained and the relative humidity was maintained. They had a humidity generator in there to keep it moist, because I think this was down in New Mexico where it's typically really dry. And what happened is their humidity instrument failed. And this particular humidity instrument, when it failed, it failed to 0%. So there was an electrical storm, shorted out the instrument, it failed, and it's sending a zero, uh, zero volt signal to the humidity, uh, the humidity generator. So it's telling the humidity generator, we have no relative humidity, we need more, give us everything you got. So the humidity generator did that. Swamped the room with, rel with humidity, everything got got condensation all over the place, destroyed this priceless art. Turns out they chose the least expensive humidity uh, controlling device they could. And this this company offered higher end devices that had backups for electrical surges and had and you could set the failure mode and so on. So the fact they saved well, maybe they saved a thousand dollars. That was a case where certainly the cost of a poor measurement was couldn't even be measured. So price range is relative, of course, and uh, it's not always the best choice to go for the least expensive. It's not always the best choice to go for the most expensive, but go through this process to help you determine what range is appropriate to spend. How to choose a manufacturer, Michael, how do we do that? So the manufacturer is also very important, uh, especially if you've gone through your application and you see, hey, there's a whole lot of instruments that will work for me. Uh, how can I choose the manufacturer that's going to best fit my requirements? Some key things to look at is what level of support might be required. This could be support in selecting the best instrument for the application, but it can also be support after the sale, uh, be that after sale calibration or repair services, or if you've got questions about the, the results that have come up or you've got a technical problem with the system, what level of support is there from that manufacturer to get you through any issues that you've got? And that ties in very closely to the type of expertise that's needed. Uh, do they have the expertise to get you through your problems uh, and help you have a, a proper system up and running? Uh, potentially, you want to have some sort of local service center or depot support uh, available domestically. You might have a requirement for it to for them to be able to send a field service technician to you to your site very quickly, or maybe being able to send something back to, to a depot in the same country is good enough. Or in some cases, you'd, be, you'd have to send something internationally, uh, potentially to be recalibrated or repaired. So you need to look at what level of support do you need from a service center uh, perspective and where, where do you need that service center to be? Uh, how have you been treated during the purchasing process? Uh, I've always found the better I'm treated up front, it, it's an indication of what sort of service I can get after the fact as well. Uh, if, if there's no time spent on my application beforehand, probably I'm not going to get the support that I want afterwards. Quite often we might want to get a demo instrument uh, to be able to try out our particular application and get an idea of the data that we're going to get or the, the type of uh, response that we're going to get to see if a, a product will actually work for us. So is it important that we're able to get that demo instrument or perhaps even an on-site visit uh, and, and some sort of demonstration 
uh, of the capabilities of the instrument before we purchase it. What warranty does our product have? Uh, in the relative humidity world, the, the warranties can vary wildly anywhere from just a couple months up to a 10 year or potentially even lifetime warranties. Uh, so understand what warranty is available and if there's anything that you need to do to maintain that warranty. Sometimes the warranties are only valid if the instrument goes through its annual calibrations with that manufacturer. So be aware of, of that, any conditions that are there. Uh, I've always found though that if a company is willing to warranty an instrument for a long period of time, it shows high confidence in that instrument. And is our sales rep asking us these questions? Are they there to, to help us get through this? Uh, and with that, I'll pass it back to Bruce. I believe we've got uh, one more poll. We do. And this is a, another poll question about what we just covered. And the question is, what is most important to you in instrument selection? Is it performance? Is it price? Is it a vendor with a local presence, reliability, or durability? Which one is most important? Top of the list for you. We'll give it a few minutes, not a few minutes, a few seconds for folks to weigh in. Seems like performance and reliability are the, the key things for just about everyone so far. Yeah, it sure does. Okay. Looks like still some folks out there thinking about it. And if there's one that's not on this list that's important, go ahead and type it in the question pane. If it's something we missed, we want to know about it. Okay, I'll go ahead and close. Whoop, a couple more people coming in. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. And we'll share the results. Yeah, performance and reliability. Nobody chose price. Guess we better raise the prices, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> we can't see that. No, just kidding, everyone. Don't panic. <laughs> okay, well, let's go ahead and summarize what we, uh, what we have so far. So here's the nine things or the nine questions you should ask. And I would recommend going, making a checklist and put all these things in the checklist, even if you've got a, an easy measurement like an office building or someplace where people work, it's, you might think, well, I can, all I need is something, give me a rough range. Even if that's your case, go through this checklist because this is comprehensive. If you go through this, these nine things and everything we mentioned today, you'll nail it. And as I mentioned earlier, one of the most common problems we see with people having trouble measuring humidity is choosing the wrong instrument. Like that example I gave of the compressed air, using an RH measurement, trying to get dew point in a, in a dry condition, doesn't work. So think about your objective, your measurement, quantify your measurement environment, what is the performance you need or you will be required to have by someone who's perhaps going to come in and audit you? Which parameter do you need to measure? And how does your instrument get to that parameter? It's important to get to, get to that level. What type of output will you need? Just a display? Will you need analog? Will you need digital or something else even? How will the instrument be utilized? Portable, fixed, and if it's fixed, can the electronics live in the environment where you're measuring? if they have to. Logistical restrictions, does it have to be intrinsically safe, explosion proof, do you have to have the certification, and is only part of the instrument going to be certified or is the whole thing going to be certified? And then finally pricing, we talked about the example, Benjamin Franklin's quote that the, I can't remember it now, but it was the sweetness of a low price is usually long forgotten when there's a bitterness of the product something along those lines. And finally, manufacturer. What's important to you for a manufacturer? Maybe you get everything else you need and it comes down to manufacturer and you want somebody local just in case, or you want someone in, in your time zone just in case, or maybe that's not important. 
or what's the warranty? What are all the other things the manufacturer offers and do you need them? I think one thing that's important for us to recognize through this process is it's, it will vary each time as to which one of these questions is going to actually be the determining factor for which instrument we, we select. Uh, in some cases, the requirements, the performance requirements may be the dominant factor. In another decision, it could be pricing. But it, it's still important to go through all of them uh, in order to make a, a proper decision for the application. We've got time for a couple more questions here. And we've got some in the queue, or if you have one that comes to mind, go ahead and type it in. And here's a question, Michael. Probably it might be on the minds of a lot of folks out there listening. What is the price range of a standard instrument? It's a, it's a tough question. Uh, for relative humidity instruments, you're, you're dealing with, with costs between $20, $30, up to $40, $50, $100,000 uh, for some high-end chilled mirrors. So common instruments, uh, if, if you're looking at the, the starting range for them, data loggers, that sort of thing, you're, you're probably looking in the, the 50 to $50 to, a, to even a thousand dollars is where the data loggers will sit. Most of the transmitters are in the, the 500 to two, three thousand dollar range. Uh, and then if you're getting into the high end chilled mirrors, you're talk, starting at a couple thousand dollars for, for the entry level versions and right up, I, I've seen them quoted as a, at $100,000 or similar uh, for the very high end chilled mirrors that, that are going to the very low frost points with very high accuracy. So there's quite a range uh, overall. So all over the place really, which all the more reason to think, think long and hard about what your requirements are. Here's an interesting one. What if I need an explosion proof instrument? And I can take this one. I have a little experience with this. And there's two different categories here for, for um, this type of instrument. There's intrinsically safe. An intrinsically safe instrument means that you, it's designed so there will not be a spark. Explosion proof means that the instrument or the case is designed so that if there is an explosion, it'll be contained. So if you need truly need an explosion proof instrument, usually that means you'll need an external container that will control contain any type of explosion that may occur. Last question. Michael, does a digital signal offer better accuracy than an analog signal? Uh, it's a little hard to say. Uh, you need to look at the particular instrument. Um, Quite often, a, a digital signal will give you the capability of having higher resolution than an an analog signal, but not always. Um, it, it it really depends on the on the given instrument instrument and the the output range. Uh, if there's a very large range uh, of output, uh, of course, a digital signal has the potential for for better resolution than a than what an analog signal would have, uh, but it is it is going to vary instrument to instrument. Um, can't say for sure which one's going to be better. Quite often, both are going to be adequate for a particular application. Okay, and that's all the time we have today. Thank you, everybody, for coming out today and listening to our, our nine points to choose for selecting a best fit humidity instrument. And we hope you found it useful. And of course, if you have questions, feel free to reach out to us separately. Here's our contact information. And Michael, thank you very much for participating today. Great information. Thanks, Bruce. And thanks, everyone, for attending.